Not all presidential elections in American history are created equal. Some of them are hugely consequential, and historians spend a lot of time on them. The 1896 contest between William McKinley and Willie, William Jennings Bryan is likely to pop up in history books. So are elections that were contested, unusual for some reason, or extremely close. 2000, 1876, and 1824, I'm looking at you. But for every historically noteworthy election, there are a lot of snoozers, too. I mean, can you even name who ran against Theodore Roosevelt in 1904? Can anyone really say that the election of 1956 was a turning point in American history? There was a book written about the 1984 election between Ronald Reagan and Walter Mondale whose title was literally, Wake Us When It's Over. There was one election though which was so strange, so unusual, and so utterly bonkers that it really should stand out in American history. But incredibly, it doesn't. It's treated as one of the snoozers, and that, to be honest, absolutely astonishes me. Not only does this bizarre election need a YouTube video about it, it needs a deep dive, in-depth video, the kind that no one else on YouTube, no, not even you, Mr. Beat, would be crazy enough to do. Before we begin, I'm going to skip to the end. In 1872, Ulysses S. Grant, Republican and former military hero of the Civil War, comfortably won re-election by a landslide victory, 286 electoral votes and 55.6% of the popular vote. It was not close. Grant's opponent, Horace Greeley, was alive on election day, but the Grim Reaper struck before all the votes were counted. It's generally not too hard to beat a candidate who's pushing up daisies, unless you're John Ashcroft. So that is one thing that's very odd about this election, that one of the candidates died. 1872 is also remembered as the election where feminist activist Susan B. Anthony was arrested and put on trial for having voted in it, leading to a critical moment in the long fight for gender equality in America. But there's a lot more about the 1872 presidential election that's very, very strange and that you probably didn't know, like the fact that one of America's two major political parties decided to sit it out entirely, or that it was contested in some very ominous ways that would have particular resonance four years later, in 1876, one of those elections that your history teacher probably did spend a lot of time on. So let's dive in. Once we're done with this amazing story, you may never look at presidential elections or 19th century political history quite the same way again. Buckle up for the very bizarre story of the U.S. presidential election of 1872. Hi, I'm Sean Munger. I'm a PhD historian, author, and teacher. I also do some tutoring. And occasionally I do deep dive videos on historical topics. You may have seen my recent in-depth look at the Iran-Contra scandal, which has been very popular lately, or my lengthy original research piece on the uh, history of the Amway multi-level marketing tools cult. Less well known is my biographical video on the 14th president, Franklin Pierce. I have a short book out just recently on Amazon Kindle, The 50 Most Important Things in History. Link to that is in the description. This video is the story of the presidential election of 1872. Its background, context, who the major players were, what happened, why it happened, and most importantly, what it means. Historians, even those who deal with the Reconstruction era after the U.S. Civil War, typically spend little time on this story or skip it over entirely. It really astonishes me that they do that. While 1872 looks like one of the snoozers, a popular president cruising to re-election without breaking a sweat, it really isn't, once you start digging, into the, digging under the surface. I'm going to take you through this story piece by piece, and I'm not going to neglect the historical context. Someone commented recently, I think it was on my Iran-Contra video, that most YouTube historians sacrifice context for brevity, and I don't tend to do that. Context is everything in history, and as you can tell, this is not a short video. So if you don't want to watch it all in one chunk, what I suggest you do is bookmark it and then come back to it over a period of several days, chapter by chapter. I've tried to mark the chapters pretty clearly as to what they're about and what they contain. You can find a listing in the description. My basic argument in this video is that the 1872 election, in addition to being very strange in its uh, pattern of facts, 
also foreshadowed some of the factors that made the next election, 1876, perhaps the most pivotal in American history. 1876, of course, was contested, and it resulted in the end of Reconstruction and the abandonment of the Southern states to 90 years of racist Jim Crow oppression. Although 1872 itself did not have anything close to those results, you can definitely see in this contest and its aftermath many of the threads that would become so pivotal in the succeeding contest. Historians have tended to ignore this, treating 1876 as a kind of black swan event in American history, when in reality you could see it coming from a mile away. To understand how and why the 1872 election was so unusual and the important issues that it was about, we have to take a look at what America was like at that time, just seven years removed from the end of the Civil War. The picture is strange and ugly. Just a word of warning, we're going to have to talk about racism and racially motivated violence. <laughs> April 9th, 1865, Union General Ulysses S. Grant, the eventual winner of the 1872 election, accepted the unconditional surrender of the pro-slavery Confederate Army of Robert E. Lee in the front parlor of a private home at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. The ghastly civil war that had convulsed America for the past four years was over. Less than a week later, President Abraham Lincoln went out with his wife to Ford's Theater in Washington and was blown away by pro-slavery Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth, who snuck up behind the president with a Derringer pistol. Grant and his wife were supposed to have been at Ford's that night, but canceled at the last minute. The assassination resulted in the extremely unfortunate presidency of Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's vice president. Johnson was a Southern Democrat from Tennessee. When the secession crisis came in early 1861, Johnson was the only member of Congress from any of the Confederate states to oppose secession and remain loyal to the Union. In 1864, in the midst of the war, Lincoln thought that his chances, Lincoln and the Republican Party thought their chances of re-election were better if he could run a sort of a national unity candidate with a running mate that might conceivably appeal to pro-Union Democrats. So uh, Lincoln's previous vice president, Hannibal Hamlin of Maine, was changed up for Johnson. Lincoln went on to win re-election in 1864. Originally, the objective of the Union was not to abolish slavery, merely to prevent secession and rebellion. Lincoln committed the Union to abolition only through the Emancipation Proclamation of 1862. But that was a military measure designed to target the basis of the South's economy. To make abolition stick, a constitutional amendment was needed, preferably before the hostilities ended and Lincoln's military powers evaporated. Congress passed the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery in January 1865. After Lincoln's death in April, ratification of the amendment by former Confederate states became a major factor in the period of Reconstruction following the war. Now, exactly what the southern states were and what their relationship was to the Union was kind of a mess in 1865. While he was alive, Lincoln refused to recognize that these states had ever left the Union. But after the Confederacy collapsed, it was clear that they did not have functioning state governments and most of them didn't have represent representatives in Congress. For much of Reconstruction, Republican politicians spoke in terms of states being readmitted to the Union, which was technically not true if they never left. But for purposes of this analysis, the idea of readmittance to the Union, which, gen which uh, generally required a state to ratify the 13th Amendment and a certain percentage of its white male population, exactly how much was disputed, uh, had to take an oath of loyalty to the Union. The concept is useful even though it has some problems in a technical constitutional sense. And the idea of readmission also refers to what a former Confederate state had to do in order to be able to send congressmen and senators back to Washington. Oh, one thing I forgot, a pretty big thing. After the Confederate surrender, the South was occupied by Union Army troops. Remember that, it becomes important later. 
Reconstruction was the lengthy and difficult process of rebuilding the defeated South, not just physically, but reconstructing its economy and its social system so that it could exist without slavery. The central question of Reconstruction was what to do with the former slaves themselves. Were they citizens of the United States or individual states? Could they vote? Could they have full civil rights? In simpler but broader terms, were they Americans? That was the basic meaning of Reconstruction. Johnson, the new president, was not pro-Confederate, and nor was he really pro-slavery, but he was extremely racist and a passionate white supremacist. He preferred to see the South reconstructed in favor of small white uh, landowners, yeoman farmers, they were often called, who would raise crops for themselves without economic competition from either the North or from the rich planter class who had owned most of the slaves and controlled most of the money in the South before the Civil War. And certainly he wanted those people to be free of competition for, from former slaves. Prior to the opening of Congress in December 1865, Johnson tried to control the process of Reconstruction on his own terms. He tended to be very lenient to former Confederates, allowing them to regain their property and voting rights with simple and largely toothless loyalty oaths. Johnson desperately wanted to avoid the redistribution of land owned by white Southerners to African Americans who had worked that land during slavery. The result, unfortunately, was the impoverishment of African Americans in the South and everywhere, really. New systems of quasi-slavery quickly sprang up, like the monstrous sharecropping system, which bore a lot of resemblance to medieval feudalism and also to the condition of slavery that African Americans were supposed to have been freed from. Violence against African Americans in the South was endemic. Everywhere, black people were harassed, tortured, killed, and sexually assaulted. And civil authorities generally did nothing to stop these crimes or punish the perpetrators. The conflict between organized armies had ended, but in many real ways the Civil War was still going on. The whole country was ablaze with hatred. Johnson eventually fell into conflict with Congress, controlled by Republicans. We don't need to go into the twists and turns of the lengthy tug of war between presidential reconstruction and congressional reconstruction. Suffice it to say, the ideas of civil rights and especially voting rights for African American men were a political football between Johnson and Congress. A series of horrendous race riots and massacres, such as in Memphis, Tennessee in May 1866 and New Orleans in July, demonstrated the degree to which struggles over Reconstruction had terrible human costs on the ground. This was not just a political struggle. At first, the violence was more or less random, but fairly quickly after the war, it became more organized. Racist whites began to gather in groups to intimidate, terrorize, and kill African Americans. The Ku Klux Klan, founded by Confederate veterans in late 1865 or early 1866, was not the only one of these terrorist groups, but it was certainly the most well-known. The Klan and other white supremacist terrorist groups typically wore hoods and masks, in some cases to avoid identification by occupying Union troops. The terrorists become quite important to our story in short order, as we'll see. The Democratic Party, remember Johnson was a Democrat, championed the political and economic interests of white men. The Republicans, especially what's called the Radical Republicans, they really weren't that radical, supported civil and voting rights for African Americans. Consequently, ex-Confederates tended to support Democratic politicians, while those committed to racial equality were almost universally Republicans. Just a word of caution here. Some conservatives today in the early 21st century try to criticize the modern 21st century Democratic Party as being the party of slavery or the party of racism because of the historic Democratic Party's positions during the Civil War and Reconstruction era. This criticism is totally disingenuous and in fact is a form of historical denial which deliberately ignores the fact 
that supporters of racial segregation and opposition to civil rights for African Americans generally became Republicans after 1964, when Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, championed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The modern party switch deniers sometimes distort or weaponize the history of the Reconstruction era to try to make this a very badly considered point. If you doubt that the 20th century Republicans and Democratic parties switched positions over civil rights and racial issues, just look at this presidential election map from 1956, just before the Civil Rights Act, and then compare it to this one from 1968, just after it. By the way, any comments on this video that we're going to try to push party switch denial will be deleted immediately. As the presidential election of 1868 approached, a couple of important things were happening. The 14th Amendment, originally proposed in 1866, defined freed African Americans as citizens of the United States and attempted to provide some restraint on state governments that intended to violate the civil rights of those citizens. The process of ratification of this amendment was ongoing. The 14th Amendment finally got over the top in July 1868. Also about this same time that the ratification process was going on, President Andrew Johnson was being impeached by Congress as a result of his various conflicts with them. He had little political base of his own left by this time and no realistic hope of getting nominated for president in his own right, even by the Democratic Party. In May 1868, after his impeachment trial, the Senate came one vote short of removing Johnson from office. He would remain president for the next 10 months, but there was a tacit agreement between him and Congress that he would try, out of, try to stay out of trouble during that time. Since it looked like the 1868 campaign would basically be a reenactment of the Civil War at the ballot box instead of the battlefield, the Republican Party naturally thought that their strongest candidate was Ulysses Grant, the Union general who had won the Civil War. He was easily and triumphantly nominated. I'll talk about Grant in more detail in the next chapter. The Democratic Party was, by contrast, a total mess. The guy they eventually nominated, New York Governor Horatio Seymour, repeatedly tried to decline the nomination and warned the convention not to put him up. They did anyway, and he very reluctantly accepted the nomination. The campaign was mostly run by surrogates, and the candidates themselves were not that engaged. Grant, in fact, stayed home, and his campaign platform was a simple phrase, let us have peace. Hard to argue with that. Democratic Party operatives talked up Seymour on highly racist terms, claiming he was the candidate for white men and Grant was the candidate for, excuse the expression, the N-bomb. That gives you a sense of how ugly this thing got. Grant won the 1868 election handily, at least in terms of electoral votes, 214 to 80. But look at this, the popular vote number. Grant beat Seymour by only 306,592 votes, 52.7% of the popular vote to Seymour's 47.3%. If the election was indeed a rematch of the Civil War, 47% of the country was willing to side with the losers. Once Grant got into office in early 1869, he facilitated rather than opposed Congressional Reconstruction. One of the most important things he did, important to our story, was he used federal power, both military and judicial, to try to crush the white supremacist terrorists that were still raising havoc all over the South. Congress passed the Ku Klux Klan Act in 1871, one of several acts aimed at reining in the terrorists. The 1871 Act gave the occupying troops the power to round up racist terrorists and federal courts the power to try them, bypassing state and local courts that could usually be counted on to give the terrorists a pass. It worked. With these tools in hand, Grant basically decimated the Klan in several southern states, including South Carolina, the angriest and most radical of the former Confederate states. This capsule summary of Reconstruction, at least up to 1872, leaves out more than it includes. 
There's a lot more to this story, but I hope I've given you a basic lay of the land as to what a horrendous mess the United States was at this time. This is the background against which Ulysses S. Grant, the 18th president, began his campaign for re-election. Because we need to understand a little bit more about him, let's turn to him next. Hiram Ulysses Grant, yes, that was his birth name, was pretty much a failure at everything in life that he tried, except war and later politics. He was born in Ohio in 1822, the son of a merchant and tanner. He did have some advantages in his early life, chief among them a father who managed to convince a U.S. congressman to nominate his son to go to West Point. Grant graduated from that august institution in 1843, 21st out of 39 in his class. By that time, he was known as Ulysses Grant, or simply Sam, to his friends. Never mind why, the names thing is a really long story. He served in the Mexican-American War, which he denounced as an unjust land grab, and he married Julia Dent, the sister of a West Point classmate. Grant was an alcoholic. He quit the army in 1854 rather than quit drinking, which his commanding officer at the time insisted that he do. Largely a failure in civilian life, Grant was pretty much a nobody, with very few prospects until the war broke out in the spring of 1861, and West Point graduates were needed in the Union Army. At first, Grant was a fairly minor commander, although promising. He made his bones principally by winning two important battles, Shiloh in April 1862, and the critical one, Vicksburg, in July 1863 which enabled Union forces to split the Confederacy and control the Mississippi River. Lincoln appointed Grant overall commander of Union forces in March 1864. After a series of sanguinary battles, mostly in Virginia, Grant finally proved bold and tenacious enough to prosecute the war to its finish. And as I said in the last chapter, he accepted the surrender of Robert E. Lee's pro-slavery army on April 9, 1865. At age 43, Grant was the youngest president in American history up to that time, when he was inaugurated in March 1869. Johnson, who detested him, the feeling was mutual, refused to attend his successor's inauguration, the last such inaugural snub by an outgoing president until that other guy did it in 2021. Among 19th century presidents, Grant was surprisingly progressive. He supported the 14th Amendment and urged the passage of the 15th, which would cement beyond all doubt that African-American men had the right to vote. It did pass in 1870. Grant also supported women's suffrage and took a considerably more conciliatory approach to dealing with Native Americans than most of his predecessors had done. Even in foreign affairs, he wasn't bad, managing to come to a delicate diplomatic rapport with Britain over issues arising from British support of the Confederacy during the Civil War. And as we saw in the last chapter, he was quite effective in rounding up white supremacist terrorists in the South. Grant did have a major weak spot, though. He tended to trust people a little too easily. This was the genesis of various scandals of the Grant administration. The first big one was Black Friday. Nothing to do with flat screen TVs or sales the day after Christmas. Rather, it involved the sale of gold by the U.S. Treasury and the redemption of greenbacks, paper money, issued during the Civil War. Two Wall Street pirates, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk, got their hooks into Grant's brother-in-law, hoping that they could influence when and how much gold was sold by the U.S. Treasury, and they were hoping to corner the gold market in the process. On September 24th, 1869, a Friday, their attempt to corner the Wall Street gold market ultimately failed, but Grant's unwitting role in the scheme left a bad taste in many people's mouths. In 1870 and 71, there was a scandal involving illegal fees and kickbacks at the New York Customs House. New York was where the majority of foreign goods entered the United States, and customs, duty were then, customs duties were then the federal government's chief revenue source. Grant's private secretary and one of his friends were implicated in this scandal. There was also a crooked deal going on in the post office, where lucrative postal delivery, delivery routes called star routes were sold to fat cats in rigged auctions and also used for bribery. 
and the whole credit mobiliere thing, which really didn't involve Grant personally, but it came to light during the 1872 campaign and was in the papers a lot. That involved a lot of nest fleecing in the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, which had been completed just after Grant took office. Suffice it to say, there were various stinky clouds of scandal in the air around the time that Grant was gearing up to run for re-election. And there were legitimate questions about his judgment in who he trusted and who he allowed to hand out government jobs. Grant was not personally crooked, but he really wasn't very good at running a tight and honest ship within the government that he headed. Furthermore, he was lukewarm on one of the major ideas that would have ended many, or at least ameliorated many of these scandals, which was civil service reform. We're going to see that issue pop up a lot in 1872. Part of Grant's problem was that as a general rule, good military commanders tend to make poor presidents. There are some exceptions. Eisenhower wasn't bad, for instance. But the problem with Grant, which he had in common with other presidents from military backgrounds, was that he gave orders like a military commander, expecting them to be carried out exactly as given, all down through the chain of command. Politics and government did not work that way. Grant had little understanding of hidden agendas or stroking the big egos that one usually finds in political life. Was he out of his depth in the White House? Well, you can make an argument for that. The important point for our purposes is that although he was quite popular with the American people in 1872, Grant did have some chinks in his armor, politically speaking, and he did have some powerful enemies. Let's meet some of them in the next chapter. During the Civil War, Missouri, a state especially divided between pro-Union and pro-Confederate factions, also had a divided Republican Party. Generally, those who favored conciliation with the South were opposed to those who wanted to punish the rebels. The antagonism in the party continued after the war was over. In 1870, the Missouri Republican Party split during the statewide convention to nominate candidates for governor. The issue in that controversy was whether ex-Confederates should have their voting rights restored and what, sh what they should have to do to achieve that. The so-called liberals favored lenient amnesty for ex-rebels. The so-called radicals wanted a harder line. 250 Missouri Republicans split off from the main party and formed a new one, the Liberal Republican Party, which nominated Benjamin Gratz Brown for governor. Brown was successful and was elected governor of Missouri that fall. Brown and the Liberal Republicans soon found another powerful ally in the state, Senator Carl Schurz. Now this guy had an interesting life. Born in Prussia, Schurz was a liberal revolutionary who took part in the wave of mini revolutions that broke out across Europe in 1848. Exiled from Prussia, he settled in France and came to the United States in 1852, where he quickly became involved in American politics, especially the anti-slavery cause. Schurz served with distinction as a general in the Union Army during the Civil War. In 1868, he was elected to the U.S. Senate from the state of Missouri as a Republican. Now, you would think he'd be a pretty good asset to President Grant. But in 1870, Schurz broke with the Grant administration over, you guessed it, Reconstruction policy. Schurz, Brown, and others were founders of Missouri's Liberal Republican Party. But soon, they attain attained national stature, aided by newspapers in the North, many of whose editors constantly wrote pieces attacking Grant and the corruption of his administration. Another politician who was destined to break from Grant was Lyman Trumbull, senator from Illinois. Originally a Democrat, Trumbull became a Republican in 1858 and supported the Union. In fact, he co-wrote the 13th Amendment. But Trumbull was not really down with the idea of full equality for African Americans, with whom he didn't want white people to have to compete for jobs. In 1868, he was one of four Republican senators who voted to acquit Andrew Johnson of impeachable offenses. He eventually joined the Liberal Republicans. There was also Cassius Clay, no relation to Muhammad Ali. Cassius Marcellus Clay was from Kentucky and before the Civil War, a rarity, a prominent anti-slavery Southern politician. 
After serving as ambassador to Russia, Clay returned home in 1869, now out of office, and he carped from the sidelines at what he considered the Republicans going too far with the whole Reconstruction project. He was a natural to join up with the liberal Republicans. The problem with the liberal Republicans is that many people supported them for different reasons. You can't really paint them all with the same brush. Many of them thought that it was time for Reconstruction to be over. Slaves were freed, 14th and 15th Amendments passed, what more could anyone want? Others were uncomfortable at the Grant administration's tendency toward scandal and Grant's indifference toward the thing that might have fixed it, some type of civil service reform. Schurz, in particular, hammered the corruption and civil service issues. Needless to say, at least on Reconstruction-related issues, politicians who favored the liberal Republicans generally believed in what you might call Reconstruction light. Not that different from the type of Reconstruction that Andrew Johnson had wanted. Mind you, liberal Republicans were not Democrats, and they did not openly pine for the days of slavery and totally unfettered white supremacy. And they weren't all fans of Andrew Johnson. Benjamin Gratz Brown, for example, detested him. But many of the liberal Republicans did tend to think that the federal government should support the rights of upper-class Southern whites and not make civil and social equality for African Americans the centerpiece of the Reconstruction project. During 1871 and 1872, the liberal Republicans of Missouri organized like-minded politicians in other states, especially New York and the states of New England. Republican Party leaders tried to discourage them, but to no avail. Grant had already written off Shures as an enemy, and he didn't try very hard to reconcile him and his followers. A convention of the Missouri Liberal Republicans in January 1872 called for a national convention to be held in Cincinnati, Ohio on May 1st. The convention was held at Cincinnati's Sangerfest Hall, also known as Exposition Hall. The music hall today sits on the same site but is not the same building. Historians have remarked on how many original founders of the Republican Party from the 1850s were involved with the convention, not just the liberal Republican politicians, but people like David Davis, Supreme Court Justice, who was known for his impartiality, and Charles Francis Adams, son of President John Quincy Adams and grandson of the second president, John Adams. The leader of the party, such as it was, was Karl Schurz. However, as he'd been born in Prussia, he was ineligible to serve as U.S. president. Among the politicians favored for president by the liberal Republicans, Charles Francis Adams had the most name recognition and was the most well-respected. He probably could have gotten the nod, the third Adams in successive generations to be nominated for president, but there was a problem. The liberal Republicans realized they couldn't win alone. They were, after all, a splinter faction of the Republicans who had preserved the Union, abolished slavery, and passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. If they had any chance of evicting Grant from the executive mansion, they, the liberal Republicans, were going to have to appeal to voters who would otherwise have voted Democratic. And as you recall from 1868, the Democratic Party at this time had set itself up as the party of racist white men. Charles Francis Adams had been a strong abolitionist before the war and came from the bluest of Yankee blue blood dynasties. Kind of hard to get racist ex-Confederates in South Carolina and Virginia to vote for him. Furthermore, Adams, though he generally supported the views of liberal Republicans, was not too keen on running for president in his own right. He preferred to be behind the scenes. He let it be known that he would not accept the nomination if it were given to him anyway. So the Cincinnati Convention cast about for a second choice, somebody with name recognition, somebody who had gone on record criticizing Grant, and preferably someone who might conceivably win a few votes in the South or especially New York State, both Democratic strongholds. As the balloting got underway at the convention and enthusiasm for Adams subsided, another name began floating upwards in the rankings, Horace Greeley, longtime newspaper publisher from New York City. Greeley was not a career politician. He'd made his name in the newspaper business and had gone on record attacking Grant. He was sort of an avatar in which all manner of anti-Grant people could find something in him that he liked. 
Name recognition was a huge factor in why he became a candidate. We'll talk more about Greeley himself in the next chapter. On the fifth ballot at the Cincinnati convention, Adams peaked with 309 votes to Greeley's 348. The sixth ballot was somewhat chaotic. It was taken one time and then apparently revised, with several state delegations changing their votes before the final tally was announced. It's not really that important what happened, except that the chairman of the convention certified that Greeley had received a majority of the delegates' votes. He was the Liberal Republican's nominee for President of the United States in 1872. Benjamin Gratz Brown, governor of Missouri, was nominated for vice president. The party's platform was in some ways more important than the candidates. Regarding the restoration of, of voting rights, namely to ex-Confederates, the official platform said, quote, We demand the immediate and absolute removal of all disabilities imposed on account of the rebellion, which was finally subdued seven years ago, believing that universal amnesty will result in complete pacification in all sections of the country. End quote. The platform never mentioned Grant by name, but there was no doubt who it was referring to when it said, quote, The civil service of government has become a mere instrument of partisan tyranny and personal ambition and an object of selfish greed. We therefore regard such thorough reforms of the civil service as one of the most pressing necessities of the hour, that the offices of the government cease to be a matter of patronage and that public station again become a post of honor. To this end, it is imperatively required that no president shall be a candidate for re-election. End quote. At this time, presidential candidates did not attend political conventions personally. Greeley, in fact, was back home in New York when the convention happened. Notified by letter that he'd been nominated, he wrote back to Carl Schurz on May 20th. I am confident, he said, that the American people have already made your cause their own, fully resolved that their brave hearts and strong arms shall bear it on to triumph. In this faith, I accept your nomination in the confident trust that the masses of our countrymen, North and South, are eager to clasp hands across the bloody chasm which has so long divided them, forgetting that they have been enemies in the joyous consciousness that they are and must henceforth remain brethren. End quote. Few finer examples of overstuffed 19th century oratory can be found anywhere. But the question was, could Greeley actually win? You already know the answer, so perhaps a better question is, did he? I demand that we examine that question in the next chapter. When I teach my history students about the 1872 election, and I show them this picture, they inevitably laugh. Even by 19th century standards, Horace Greeley looks kinda nuts. Neck beards were considerably more respectable in the 1870s than they are today, but this one is pretty out of control. This person looks more like you'd imagine Ebenezer Scrooge in a community playhouse production of A Christmas Carol than a serious contender for President of the United States. I told you this is the strangest election in American history. Horace Greeley was born in this house near Amherst, New Hampshire in 1811. His parents were poor farmers. Greeley was smart, but probably neurodivergent. In 1826, age 15, he became an apprentice to a newspaper publisher, I'm sorry, a newspaper printer in East Poultney, Vermont, and learned the printing trade. This was a pretty good profession in early Republic America, and one with significant inroads into politics, as we'll see. In 1831, Greeley went to New York City to try to find employment in the newspaper and printing business. He spent much of the 1830s either working for newspapers or trying to get his own going. During this period, in 1836, he got married to Mary Young Cheney, who pops up in our story later on. She was a very strange person, possibly mentally ill, we don't know, reportedly terrible to their children, most of whom died young. Greeley himself took no part in raising his own kids. Nice parenting there, Horace. In 1841, Greeley founded the New York Tribune, 
which he sought to make a paper of national rather than a purely local importance. He was the first newspaper man to have a beat reporter in Washington, D.C. reporting on national affairs. The paper was widely distributed outside of New York, especially to rural areas and small towns in the Midwest. Middle America, you might say. Greeley initially supported the Whig Party. Now, you have to understand that the idea that journalists were supposed to be objective and nonpartisan was absolutely unknown in the 19th century. A newspaper that didn't wear its politics on its sleeve or its front page had no hope of competing in a hyper-partisan media environment. So the idea of journalistic neutrality, that is a modern invention. It did not exist in the 19th century. Greeley's political brand was strongly anti-slavery. He eventually turned against the Whig Party and was hostile to any sort of political compromise with slaveholders. As the circulation of the New York Tribune increased, so did Greeley's influence. An editorial by him could make or break a politician or influence public opinion on national legislation. Though I did not mention Greeley by name in my recent video on the presidency of Franklin Pierce, he was one of the powerful voices in the press who made Pierce so unpopular. When a number of ex-Whig party prominents and people who had supported the Free Soil Party started talking about starting a brand new political party in 1854, pledged to stopping the spread of slavery to newly acquired territory, Greeley was involved. It is possible that he even coined the name the Republican Party. An enemy of early Republican heavyweight William Seward, Greeley was delighted when Abraham Lincoln bested him, Seward, for the 1860 Republican nomination. Lincoln's election in 1860 sparked pro-slavery elements in the South to try to tear slave states away from the Union. In this period, Greeley briefly suggested in a couple of editorials that letting the slave states go might be preferable to all-out civil war. Now, he changed his mind within a couple of months, but as Greeley would learn in 1872, being an outspoken newspaper editor meant that all of his thoughts were out there in public and in print. In the early stages of the war, Greeley supported the Lincoln administration with some misgivings. Before September 1862, uh, Horace thought that Lincoln wasn't as hot as he should have been on the idea of freeing the slaves. But even after emancipation, Greeley began drifting away from being a Lincoln fanboy. He decried the violence and destruction of the war and talked about a negotiated settlement. After Atlanta fell to Union forces in 1864, though, Greeley flip-flopped again and now was strongly in favor of Lincoln's re-election. After Lincoln got blown away at Ford's Theater, Greeley kept flip-flopping. First, he wanted leniency with the South, and he even helped captured ex-Confederate President Jefferson Davis get out on bail. Then he turned against Andrew Johnson because the terms Johnson wanted for readmitting the southern states were too lenient. Greeley tried to get elected to Congress from New York. He had briefly served as a congressman in the 1840s, but the machine politics of Tammany Hall froze him out. In 1868, he supported Grant for president, then turned against him after he was in office. There was just no pleasing this guy. Grant tried to mollify Greeley by appointing him ambassador to Santo Domingo, the, what's now the Dominican Republic, a country which was the focus of controversy in Grant's administration. Grant wanted and unsuccessfully tried to annex that country to the United States. Greeley refused the appointment. By the time Greeley was nominated for president in May 1872, he had not held public office since 1849. He had pulled back a bit from being in day-to-day -day command of the Tribune, having delegated a lot of its functions to Whitelaw Reed, and most importantly for our purposes, Greeley was the primary caregiver for his wife, who had been sick with tuberculosis for over 20 years. This was perhaps not the best time in life to be running for president, but whatever. The major issue with Greeley's candidacy was his 30 years of well-documented flip-flops. Anyone who wanted to attack him had merely to read old issues of the New York Tribune. And with often, as often as Greeley changed his mind and as loudly as he trumpeted his ever-changing opinions across America's editorial pages, anyone could find anything to use against him. For example... Greeley was not pro-Confederate, but he briefly supported the idea 
of letting the southern states secede. He was an enemy of Andrew Johnson, but you could also find stuff in his editorials where he supported him. Similarly, though he was running against Grant, he was strongly for him in 1868. In short, whether fair or not, it was easy to paint Greeley as an opportunist, shifting positions in the wind, or else a doddering old fool who just liked to get his opinions into print, whatever they were, and make himself out as some sort of public intellectual. Remember, Greeley was the choice of the liberal Republican Party, a splinter faction of the Republicans. You have to keep this in mind as we move into the next bizarre phase of this election, the part where the Democratic Party shoots itself in the foot. That's in the next chapter. The Democratic Party in 1872 was something of a joke. The last president they had elected was James Buchanan in 1856, who was another disaster and who didn't lift a finger to stop secession and civil war. As you recall, Andrew Johnson was a Democrat, but he succeeded to the White House by assassination, not election. His sorry record, and especially his impeachment, did no favors for the post-Civil War Democratic Party. The problem for Democrats in the 1870s is that what they really wanted to be and what they really stood for was a lot of the stuff the country had just fought a brutal civil war to get rid of. It was 18 years earlier, in 1854, when Stephen Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act had split both the major political parties at that time, the Whigs and the Democrats, and caused them to reorganize along regional lines, a mostly northern-based Republican Party opposed to the spread of slavery, and a mostly southern-based Democratic Party which thought slavery was just fine. While not all Democrats were pro-slavery Confederate rebels, all pro-slavery Confederate rebels were Democrats. And as you recall, in 1868, the party explicitly ran against Grant as the white supremacy party. Essentially, the Democrats of the early 1870s were dominated by ex-Confederates and generally pandered to what they wanted politically, which was slavery and white supremacy. Slavery clearly was not coming back, but white supremacy throughout the South was very much an achievable goal, if not for all those pesky Union troops occupying the southern states and cracking down on terrorist groups like the KKK. This was not a winning platform for a national campaign. If they were going to retake the presidency, especially against the popular Grant, Democrats would have to appeal not just to unreconstructed Southerners, but to Northern Democrats, the kind of people who supported the Union during the war, but who thought that Lincoln and the Republicans had gone too far. New York was an important Democratic state and the key to the election. It's no accident that their 1868 candidate, Horatio Seymour, was from New York. It was their best chance to win. In 1871, one of the leading Northern Democrats who had been opposed to the war, Clement Vallandigham, former congressman from Ohio, urged the Democratic Party to stop trying to refight the Civil War and accept some elements of Reconstruction, especially the 14th and 15th Amendments, as a done deal. This strategy was called the New Departure. During the war, Vallandigham had been a part of a faction called the Copperheads, who many pro-Union Northerners thought were traitors. The New Departure was a way to turn the page from all of that and to try to compete in the new reality of American politics, which the Union victory had changed dramatically. Vallandigham proposed this strategy in a series of resolutions he published in May 1871. Just a couple of months later, he killed himself accidentally by shooting himself in the stomach demonstrating to a group of lawyers how the victim of a barroom brawl supposedly shot himself instead of being killed by Vallandigham's client, a defendant in a murder case. Vallandigham croaked, but his client was acquitted. Anyway, the new departure was a bitter pill for a lot of Southern Democrats to swallow. It was a good idea and had, been, had, had a lot of prominent adherents in the North, but the party as a whole wasn't too enthusiastic about it. Consequently, in 1872, it was hard to find a Democrat who wanted to run for president. Horatio Seymour, already a one-time loser, 
most, was mostly retired from politics, and with Vallandigham in the funeral parlor, the Democrats didn't really have any stars on their bench. Nevertheless, as the summer approached, so did the National Convention. The 1872 Democratic National Convention was held at Ford's Grand Opera House in Baltimore. A bit ironic, because the venue was built and owned by John T. Ford, who also owned the theater in Washington, where Lincoln had had his bad night in 1865. The DNC in 1872 was kind of a joke. For one thing, it lasted only six hours, uh, split over two days. It was the shortest major party nominating convention in American history. August Belmont, the chairman of the Democratic Party, gave a long-winded speech which was the usual howl of rage against Grant, corruption, and the military rule of the South. He also acknowledged that Horace Greeley had been an enemy of the Democratic Party for years, but Belmont framed the abuses of the Grant administration as a situation so dire that it required putting aside partisanship and doing the right thing. It was pretty clear there was not going to be a real Democratic convention. The Democrats were going to endorse Greeley and the liberal Republicans as their own candidates. Some of the delegates had other ideas, but an alternative plan didn't really get off the ground. There was talk of nominating Jeremiah Black, who had been Attorney General and Secretary of State under James Buchanan, and also talk of nominating a Union General, William Franklin, as if he could compete with Grant. He knew it and demanded his name not be put in consideration. On the first and only ballot, Greeley got 686 votes, Black 21, and a handful of votes for two other politicians. The chairman moved to make the overwhelming vote for Greeley unanimous. The motion passed. The Democratic Party had just nominated a Republican for president. The Democrats were essentially electing to sit out the 1872 election. Just to put this in perspective as to how bizarre this is in American history, this would be like, in the upcoming 2024 election, the Republican Party deciding to take a pass and officially nominating Robert Kennedy Jr. as their candidate for president. Before 1872, the last time one of the two major parties decided not to field a candidate of their own for president at all was in 1820, when the moribund Federalist Party, which had mostly disintegrated, held no convention and nominated no candidate officially. Strategically, it seems like suicide, at least on the surface. When a major political party splits, it almost always inures to the benefit of the opposition party, such as what happened in 1912, when former President Teddy Roosevelt ran against the incumbent Republican, William Howard Taft, and thus threw the election to Woodrow Wilson, who got considerably fewer votes than Taft and Roosevelt combined. But that did not happen in 1872. The Democrats calculated that if they ran a candidate of their own, the best they could hope to do was to split the anti-Grant vote, which was not a big enough percentage of Republicans to make a difference. In 1912, the incumbent Taft was extremely unpopular. Grant, by contrast, was very popular. Thus, the Democrats seem to have concluded, why bother? This is truly an outlier in American history. There are plenty of other elections where a very popular incumbent looked and was unbeatable. Teddy Roosevelt in 1904, Coolidge 1924, Nixon in 1972, Eisenhower in 1956, Reagan in 1984. But in all of those elections, the opposition party still found enough reasons to step up to the plate and nominate somebody, if only to offer token opposition. The Democrats in 1872, though, couldn't even bring themselves to do that. This has never happened in American history since. Let's turn now to the campaign itself. The Republicans' convention of 1872 was mostly a snooze. It got going on June 5th at the Academy of Music in Philadelphia, this building here, which seems an odd venue for a national political convention. Then again, the convention didn't have much business on the agenda. To the surprise of absolutely no one, President Ulysses Grant was nominated unanimously and by acclamation. There was a little bit of drama over the vice presidential nomination. The sitting vice president, Schuyler Colfax, former speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, had gotten himself into a spot of trouble. 
For some bizarre reason, he'd been under the impression that Grant would serve only one term as president. Colfax wanted to succeed him and get the 1872 nomination. So he told everybody he would not be a candidate for vice president in 1872. When Grant decided to run, though, Colfax changed his mind. Suddenly, he did want to be vice president again, and this alienated some Grant supporters. Furthermore, some liberal Republicans had talked about the possibility of Colfax being nominated as their candidate. Colfax didn't really try to bring this about, but the fact that there was talk about it did him no favors. At the convention, therefore, the sole moment of drama, if it could be called that, was when the convention delegates dumped Colfax as vice president and instead nominated Henry Wilson, senator from Massachusetts. It was just as well. Not long after the convention, as the campaign got going, Schuyler Colfax was implicated in the Credit Mobiliere scandal, accused of taking bribes from railroad companies in exchange for wrangling pro-railroad votes in Congress when the Transcontinental Railroad was being financed. Incidentally, the new Veep nominee, Wilson, was also accused of this, but he was able to provide evidence to a congressional investigating committee that cleared his name. Colfax wasn't. His name was mud for the rest of the 1872 campaign, but it didn't matter because Wilson was going to replace him as vice president in any event. There were a couple of third parties in the mix, as there usually are. There was a labor reform party, which stood for pretty much what their name suggests. Both of their intended nominees, Charles O'Connor, a fe former federal district attorney, and Supreme Court Justice David Davis, turned down the nomination. The straight-up Democratic Party refused to go along with the nomination of Greeley, so they tried to nominate O'Connor, too. He refused that nomination also, but he did appear on a couple of state ballots. 1872 was also the first election where a woman ran for president. Victoria Woodhull, the first female stockbroker on Wall Street, was nominated for president by the Equal Rights Party, despite the fact that she was below the constitutionally mandated age of 35 to be able to serve as president. Her running mate was noted abolitionist and African-American activist Frederick Douglass, who was not at the convention and didn't bother to respond when Woodhull wrote to inform him that he'd been nominated. I'm going to cover the story of Victoria Woodhull and the very complicated saga of women's suffrage in 1872, which involves Susan B. Anthony and her famous vote, in Chapter 11. Presidential candidates did not really campaign in the 19th century the way that modern ones do. That is, with one notable exception, Horace Greeley, because, of course, he was an outlier. Greeley went on a speaking tour through Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana, giving some stump speeches. He hammered the usual issues. Grant was corrupt, he opposed civil service reform, and military government of the South was unfair, especially in how he said that it interfered with the voting process. Of course, as we know, it was only because of those Union troops in the South that African American men got to vote at all. Greeley was pandering to the Democratic Party's racist base without taking overtly racist positions himself. Grant didn't campaign. He didn't have to. What would have been the point? He let newspaper editors and party hacks sing his praises, but most of the electorate had already made up their mind to vote for him again. So why do anything to spoil that? Plus, Greeley was crucifying himself, both with, both with his inconsistent flip-floppy positions that were long in print in his own newspapers, and also on that speaking tour, which served merely to highlight how odd and unreliable Greeley was. So really, the major event of the 1872 campaign was Greeley's speaking tour. At one point, he and his supporters seemed to think that he would win, possibly handily, but these illusions evaporated pretty quickly. In any event, Greeley himself was distracted from the campaign by his wife's declining health. In the summer, she returned from a trip abroad, possibly undertaken to treat her tuberculosis. People in the 19th century often thought that a change of climate or hanging out at a spa would cure conditions like this. It didn't often have that effect. When she first got home, before Horace embarked on his speaking tour, Mary seemed much improved. But then, as the summer wore on, her condition worsened. Greeley's daughter Ida wrote to him from their family farm in Chappaqua, New York. 
that Mary Greeley had suffered a relapse and her condition was deteriorating. In early October, Greeley suspended his presidential campaign and returned home to tend to his wife. He made no more speeches and conducted no more campaign business. Throughout October, he wrote letters to friends, associates, and supporters, which attained an increasingly gloomy character as the month wore on. Eventually, he moved his wife to New York City, where they stayed in the house of a friend on 57th Street. The most significant event of the 1872 presidential election occurred six days before the election, and it was not something that either of the candidates did. On October 30th, 1872, Mary Greeley died at about four in the morning. Though it had been coming for a long time, the loss devastated Horace. He didn't care much about the campaign at this point. Almost immediately, he sank into a very deep depression. A few days later, America voted. It voted overwhelmingly for Grant. This is not the end of the story, though. In fact, the election of 1872 was about to hit peak weirdness. Because voting, specifically in the South and specifically by African Americans, was the key issue at stake, and this is, after all, the 1870s, you would expect that the actual process of voting in 1872 was all sorts of screwed up. Surprisingly, you'd be wrong. It really wasn't that bad, with one major glaring exception, which we'll get to. The key factor was Grant's aggressive pursuit of white supremacist terrorism in 1871. The passage of the Ku Klux Klan Act and the resulting crackdown on racially motivated terrorism resulted in huge numbers of pro-Confederate agitators being put in jail just in time for the 1872 election. If this had not happened, these people guaranteed would have been fanning out through the countryside intimidating, beating, or even killing African Americans in the South, discouraging them from voting, or at least voting for Republicans. Those troops who were occupying the former Confederate states were pretty effective at enforcing the voting rights guaranteed by the 14th and 15th Amendments. Grant and the Republican Party could count on the support of these voters pretty much across the board. If these efforts had not been successful, Democrats who supported white supremacy wouldn't have been as pissed off as they were. One prominent historian who wrote a lot about this period, James McPherson, called 1872 the fairest and most democratic presidential election in the South until 1968. That's a pretty tall statement. Did Grant know what he was doing with those troops, the, all the extra prosecutors and the special powers of the Ku Klux Klan Act? Absolutely he did. Grant received 3,598,235 votes, or 55.6%. Greeley got 2,834,761 votes, or 43.8%. The Democrats, who I remind you again nominated a Republican for president this time, had one of their poorest showings throughout the entire 19th century in this election. Grant's proportion of the popular vote was higher than any candidate in any election since 1828, and the highest that any would score until Theodore Roosevelt ran in 1904. As for electoral votes, no one doubted that Grant had far more than 177, which is what he needed to win. Greeley could scare up at most 66. The results in Congress were even more decisive. Republicans won a two-thirds majority in the House of Representatives, capturing 199 of 272 seats. And in the Senate, despite losing two seats, Republicans still held an over 70% majority. Republicans and pro-Grant factions held a supermajority overwhelmingly in the government. Few presidents in the history of the Republic have been vindicated as strongly as Grant was in 1872. But you knew all that. I said in Chapter 1 that the outcome of this election was never seriously in doubt. The only people in America who doubted that Grant would easily cruise to a second term were Horace Greeley and some of his key supporters, but even Greeley himself realized by September that Mr. Unconditional Surrender was going to render him a grease spot at the polls. Before we get into precisely how the 1872 election got even stranger after Election Day, 
we need to talk about the one place where voting didn't go so well, and that was Louisiana. The problem here was not about who the state voted for for president, but for governor. It all began four years earlier in 1868, when a guy named Henry Warmoth, who was only 26 years old, was elected governor of Louisiana. Warmoth had taken advantage of the political turmoil in the state and the disenfranchisement of ex-Confederates to win the election just as Louisiana's new Reconstruction Constitution was coming into effect. Warmoth was pretty progressive. His lieutenant governor, Oscar Dunn, was the first African-American in the United States to serve as lieutenant governor of a state. Because the 1868 elections were such a mess in Louisiana, marred by Ku Klux Klan and other terrorist violence, Warmoth established a new body, the State Returning Board, which would certify the results of all future elections. Warmoth also augmented the federal troops occupying New Orleans, the seat of the state government at that time, with a Louisiana militia loyal to him and also a metropolitan police force. Unfortunately for him, Warmoth alienated a lot of his political allies, many of whom were African Americans, by vetoing a bill that would have greatly reduced segregation in public facilities of the state of Louisiana. He started to lose political support. With Republicans already shaky in a lot of areas in terms of unity, the Louisiana Republican Party split into a pro-grant wing and an anti-grant wing. In nearly every election between 1870 and 1872, these two factions were at odds. It got so bad that in 1871, Warmoth had to call out his state militia to take control of the Louisiana State House from the pro-grant Republicans who had seized it. Warmoth was not running for re-election in 1872. He supported a Democrat, John McEnery, who was running against the pro-grant Republican candidate, William Pitt Kellogg, then U.S. Senator from Louisiana. Warmoth endorsed Greeley for president because he hated Grant. Thus, the 1872 Louisiana election was essentially a contest between the two wings of the Republican Party in that state, with the Democratic candidate, McEnery, trying to capitalize on their dissension. Now, it's not clear what kind of voter intimidation went on in Louisiana uh, around the time of the vote. But when the election was over, both candidates, Kellogg and McEnery, declared victory. The state returning board, which, as you recall, was controlled by Governor Warmoth, declared that McEnery, the Democrat, had won. Pro-Grant Republicans, outraged, formed their own state returning board, which declared that Kellogg had won. Both candidates held victory parties and even inauguration ceremonies. But which one was the legitimate real governor of Louisiana? The Louisiana governor dispute isn't really the main subject of this video. For the record, a federal district judge eventually declared William Pitt Kellogg, the pro-Grant Republican, the legitimate governor of Louisiana. But even most Republicans smelled something fishy in this whole business. The main thing to keep in mind is that during the period immediately following the election, there were essentially two dueling groups, each claiming to be the legitimately elected government of Louisiana. This is going to affect Louisiana's electoral votes, as we'll see. There also seems to have been something going on in Arkansas. It's hard to find anything specific, but there clearly were allegations of electoral fraud involving the vote in Arkansas, probably related in some fashion to voter suppression or possibly ballot stuffing. We don't know. So as the dust settled after Election Day, here was the situation. Grant had easily won, but there were some problems in the former southern states that made the true picture a little murky. Grant did win, no question about that, but exactly how much he won by wasn't entirely clear. There was another factor, too, that threatened to make this very difficult. In short order, Horace Greeley was on his deathbed. We turn to that development next. It seems pretty clear that the death of Horace Greeley's wife affected him deeply. Just before the election, he wrote, I am not dead, but I wish I were. My house is desolate, my future dark, my heart a stone. After his wife's death and the loss of the election, Greeley briefly tried to return to day-to-day -day leadership 
of the newspaper, newspaper he had built, the Tribune, but he saw conspiracies among the people he left in charge to try to push him out. He stormed out of the Tribune office in a huff and went to the house of his friend Alvin Johnson and summoned doctors. The next day, November 13th, 1872, Greeley seems to have had a spell of delirium. He spent the day feverishly writing a bunch of papers, newspaper editorials, last wills and testaments, directions on what to do with his property, letters to friends. They were disjointed, rambling, and incoherent. He didn't finish most of them. He'd had a bad break in his mental health. Though greatly accelerated by the death of his wife, the decline of Greeley's mental health was not unexpected. A friend of his, John Bigelow, wrote in his diary, I think he has been crazy for years. Now the fact cannot be disguised. There may indeed have been a conspiracy to push him out of management of the Tribune because he was no longer mentally competent to serve as its editor. Throughout mid-November, Greeley's mental and physical health worsened. Then, on November 24th, he checked himself into a hospital called Choate House, a private institution founded by Dr. George Choate in Pleasantville, New York, only a few miles from Greeley's farm in Chappaqua. Choate House still exists and stands to this day. Here it is. Choate House had a wing set aside for mental patients, and it was known at the time as a sanatorium. Although several quote-unquote brain specialists attended Greeley at Choate's sanatorium, there wasn't much uh, they, could, uh, they could do for him. Two of his daughters were with him. Delirious, muttering religious phrases to himself, Greeley hung on for a couple of days. Then he slipped into a coma. On November 29, 1872, he died. It's not entirely clear what he died of, Diagnosing fatal illnesses retroactively across history is a tricky business. My guess is that Greeley suffered from several different physical and mental conditions that interacted with each other. His death came less than a month after the election. Because of the timing of his death and the decisiveness of Grant's victory, and the fact that Greeley was clearly mentally ill at the time of his death, a popular legend has arisen that Greeley was so distraught by the magnitude of his electoral defeat that he went crazy and died as a direct result. Consideration of facts, though, I think shows that this is not true. If his own friends thought he was insane long before the election, clearly there's evidence that his decline must not have been caused by the election. Indeed, even before his wife died, Greeley wrote a letter on October 14th after some preliminary results had come in from the state of New York in which he said, quote, You must not take our reverses to heart. I may soon have to shed some tears for my wife, who seems to be sinking at last, but I shall not give one to any possible result of the political canvas, end quote. In that period of delirium, before he checked into the asylum, he mentioned the election a few times, but took pains to point out that it was not the cause of his troubles. In the end, I don't think Greeley cared very much about the election. The fact that he pretty much gave up and abandoned all pretense of campaigning by mid-October when his wife went into her final decline demonstrates that he cared a lot more about her than about whether or not he was going to be president. Consequently, it seems that what finally pushed him over the edge into total insanity and death was the stress of his wife's death. The election had very little to do with it. A few days after his death, Greeley was afforded quite a lavish funeral procession through the streets of New York City. Fifth Avenue was lined with thousands of spectators as his coffin rolled past. Politicians, publishers, and celebrities turned out, including P.T. Barnum, the famous entertainer and showman. Also present at Greeley's funeral, riding in a special carriage, were President Ulysses Grant and his wife. Now you have to admit, that's kind of classy. Greeley was buried at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. His grave still stands there today. You're looking at it right now. It was all over for Horace Greeley, but his death threw a rather large monkey wrench into the machinery of the election of 1872, which was by no means over. Although the popular vote was over and done with, the electoral vote process was not. This was the first and to date only time in American history that a major party candidate an intended recipient of votes 
electoral votes for President of the United States had died before the electoral process was complete. The situation was unprecedented in American history. How did they deal with it? Well, that takes a little explanation, and it's the subject of the next chapter. To understand what happened next in the 1872 election, first you have to understand a bit about the mechanics of the presidential electoral process. The U.S. Constitution is involved, and there's also a timeline. To be sure, the situation with Greeley was a little different than other times, also admittedly rare, that a candidate has died during an election. At the beginning of the video, I referred to John Ashcroft, who lost an election to the U.S. Senate from the state of Missouri, to Mel Carnahan, who died in a plane crash 11 days before the election. This was in the year 2000. That was your typical dead candidate situation where someone dies so close to the election that ballots have already been printed and gone out, and there's just not enough time to retool everything before the vote. 1872 was not that situation. Here's why. There isn't, and never has been, any national vote for president. On election day, which in 1872 was not on the same day in every state, there are essentially a bunch of state-level elections for president. The voters cast their ballots, not directly for the candidates, but for technically slates of electors who are pledged to vote for the stated candidate. You probably know this. The electors themselves were, and today still are, usually party hacks appointed by the state-level Democratic or Republican parties, and their pledges to vote for their candidate are usually, but not always, binding. Once these votes of the electors occur, a state-level board or some kind of state-level uh, uh, body, the governor, a canvassing board, it's all different, but somebody will make an official count and send the actual electoral votes, which are physical pieces of paper certified legally, they'll send those to Congress. The Constitution then specifies that at an appointed time, these votes will be officially counted before a joint session of Congress. The Vice President of the United States presides over this procedure and announces the results. So here's the timeline as applied to the 1872 election. Although it's not true that all states held their presidential ballots on the same day, to make it simpler, let's just assume they all did. Most of them were held on November 5th, 1872, which was six days after the death of Greeley's wife and 24 days before Greeley's own death on November 29th. These elections resulted in pledges that certain numbers of electors would, at some point in the near future, gather in the individual states and officially cast their ballots for either Grant or Greeley. As we know, Grant won these state-level elections in at least as many states as needed to give him 177 votes, in fact considerably more, because he won handily. In 1872, there were a total of 352 electoral votes up for grabs. Most of the states cast their electoral votes here on the timeline after Greeley died. For states that Grant carried, which was most of them, it really didn't matter. The problem arose in states where Greeley had prevailed. In some of those states, the electors, recognizing that voting for a dead man was pointless, cast their votes for other candidates, mostly the also-rans at the Cincinnati Convention of the Liberal Republican Party. It didn't matter really because these guys, they were all guys, knew that it couldn't affect the outcome, and no one was going to yell at them for breaking their oaths to vote for Greeley. So, for example, in Missouri, where the liberal Republican revolt had begun, eight of Missouri's 15 electors decided to vote for Benjamin Brown, Greeley's running mate. Six voted for Thomas Hendricks, senator from Indiana, and one voted for Supreme Court Justice David Davis. In Kentucky, another state won by Greeley, eight of that state's electors voted for Hendricks, and four for Benjamin Brown. Georgia, though, was a mess. The electors of Georgia, 11 of them, met after Greeley's death. Of those 11, six decided to vote for Benjamin Brown. Two voted for former Georgia Governor Charles Jenkins, who was not even running for president from any party, whatever. 
But three of Georgia's remaining electors, originally pledged for Greeley, stubbornly stuck to that pledge and voted for him, even though they were voting for a corpse who was pushing up daisies in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. The official count of the 1872 electoral votes, the same part of the process that occurred on January 6, 2021, during the 2020 electoral cycle, happened on Wednesday, February 12, 1873. On that day, in, Cong in the Capitol, after conducting usual legislative business, the Senate, there were 74 senators at that time, filed into the chamber of the House of Representatives, the same room that's used today, for the official count. During this process, any senator or representative may object to the counting of a state's electoral votes. On this day, February 12th, there were a lot of objections. The first objection was lodged by George Frisbee Hoare, yes, that was his name, a representative from Massachusetts. He objected to the counting of electoral votes for Georgia for Greeley, because Greeley was dead at the time they were cast. This was quickly followed by another objection, this one by Senator Lyman Trumbull of Illinois. You recall he was a leading anti-Grant Republican. He objected to the electoral votes cast by Mississippi, specifically the one cast by a pro-Grant elector, James J. Spellman. The official objection had to do with Mississippi's certificate. The appointment of Spellman, who was African-American, was apparently not signed by the governor of Mississippi. More objections followed. Texas's electoral votes, Texas had voted for Greeley, were challenged, again on the basis of the qualification of the electors. Arkansas was soon thrown into the mix. There were two problems with Arkansas. The same kind of thing going on with other states regarding certificates, and also a petition had been sent to Congress by five Arkansas residents stating, quote, certain frauds alleged to have been committed at the late election. Exactly what frauds, we don't know. And as you might expect from the Louisiana mess, remember Louisiana had two dueling governors or self-proclaimed governors, the electoral votes of Louisiana were questioned. So after all the objections were lodged, 33 electoral votes were in dispute. It was not nearly enough to affect the outcome. Even if Grant lost the electoral votes in all the states whose votes for him were challenged, he'd have 264 electoral votes, far more than the 177 he needed to win. Everyone understood that the stakes were not that high. That afternoon, February 12, 1873, Congress in joint session batted around the question of what to do with these electoral votes. A bunch of resolutions were proposed. Yes, count these ones, no, don't count those ones, etc. And each resolution was put to a vote. Now, I won't bore you with all the twists and turns over the course of the afternoon, all the votes they took, but here's what all of the individual resolutions voted upon separately added up to. Arkansas, with six votes for Grant at stake, rejected. Congress did not count these electoral votes. Georgia, with a total of 11 votes, of which three cast for Greeley were at stake, rejected. Congress did not count the votes for Greeley, but they did count Georgia's other electoral votes for various candidates who were still breathing. Louisiana, with eight votes for Grant at stake, rejected. Congress didn't count these votes either. Of all the challenges, this one was probably the most legitimate, meaning this is the state where it was hardest to tell which candidate the voters of the state actually voted for. Mississippi, with eight votes for Grant at stake, including the one cast by James J. Spellman, accepted. Congress counted these votes for Grant. Texas, with eight votes for Thomas A. Hendricks of Indiana, Texas's Greeley-pledged electors met and voted for Hendricks after November 29th, they were accepted. Congress counted these votes for Hendricks. At the end of the day, the President of the Senate, in other words, the Vice President of the United States, Schuyler Colfax, officially announced the tallies. Here's how the final vote was recorded. Grant, 286, Benjamin Gratz Brown, 18, Thomas Hendricks, 42, Charles Jenkins, 2, David Davis, 1, Horace Greeley, 0. This went down as the official result of the presidential election of 1872. I didn't even bother to get into the wrangling over the vote for vice president. Suffice it to say, Grant's running mate, Henry Wilson, who was soon to replace Schuyler Colfax, 
got 286 votes, the same number that Grant did. Now, it's important to note what the nature of these disputes was. The Constitution sets out what happens when no candidate for president gets a majority of electoral votes cast. The election goes to the House of Representatives. That has only happened twice, once in 1801 and again in 1825. But that procedure assumes that there isn't a dispute about which electoral votes to count. There have actually been numerous elections in American history where some technical irregularity with an electoral vote certificate or qualification of a particular elector has been in the mix. In fact, there was a controversy about this in the very first contested presidential election, 1796. In that election, a rumor got started in the newspapers that the electors from the state of Vermont, four of them, were not legally appointed under the laws of that state. In February 1797, when Vice President John Adams opened the electoral vote certificates to count them, he found Vermont's votes to be in perfect order, counted it no problem. The votes also happened to be for him. So 1796 was a false alarm, but it happened for real in 1800, the very next election, and one of those two elections that went to the House of Representatives. George's certificate for electoral votes in 1800 was defective. It listed electors' names, but did not certify which ones had voted for which candidate, Thomas Jefferson or Aaron Burr. Because of all the other problems with the 1800 election, this particular problem never rose to the top of the heap. George's electoral votes were eventually counted by Vice President Thomas Jefferson for himself. But these incidents illustrate the dangerous omission in the congressional procedure to elect the president. The Constitution tells us what to do when no candidate gets a majority, but it says nothing about what to do when there's a dispute about whether a state's electoral votes are actually valid. That was what was at stake in 1872. Also, notably, it was also what the controversy would be in the following election, 1876, where several states sent in dueling slates of electoral votes, each purporting to be genuine, which was basically what happened in Louisiana in 1872. It didn't make a difference in 1872 because Grant won so decisively. But the unanswered question here was, what if it did make a difference as to who won? That was precisely the question that the nation would face in 1876, the famous disputed election that your history teacher probably did spend a lot of time on. That's the take-home point. You can see an ominous foreshadowing of the blow-up coming in 1876 by looking closely at what happened in 1872. The crisis of the 1876 election was not unprecedented. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in Chapter 12, but first we have to get to the story of how the election of 1872 was critical in the long struggle for gender equality in the United States. This is the part of the story that involves Susan B. Anthony and her famous vote. That's in the next chapter. Back in chapter 7, I mentioned the candidacy of Victoria Woodhull, the first woman to run for president of the United States. And in the opening minutes of the video, I referenced one of the few facts that is commonly known about this election, that Susan B. Anthony, noted 19th century feminist and reformer, attempted to vote in this election and was arrested and put on trial for having done so. This chapter is about that, but it's also about a lot more than just the voting incident, or even Woodhull's candidacy. And as the story is complicated, I thought it deserved its own chapter. To understand this fully, we have to go back to 1870, two years before the election, when the 15th Amendment was passed. The text of this amendment says, quote, The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, end quote. The amendment, formally ratified in February 1870, was an attempt to make clear that formerly enslaved people, freed by the 13th Amendment and made citizens by the 14th, could not have their voting rights suppressed, especially by racist state governments in the South. 
However, the women's rights movement, which had been active for decades thanks to feminist reformers like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and yes, Susan B. Anthony, they saw the 14th and 15th Amendments as a major step forward. They argued that on their face, these two amendments guaranteed American women the right to vote. This idea was called the New Departure. Needless to say, most male politicians did not see it that way. Republicans and reformers, the so-called radical Republicans, were behind giving people of color the right to vote, but even for most of them, women's suffrage was a bridge too far. Voting rights were generally regulated on the state level, which was why federal constitutional amendments were needed to secure those rights for African Americans. But the idea of states being able to prohibit women from voting still had generally broad support. Victoria Woodhull was a stockbroker on Wall Street and a firebrand of the feminist movement. Late in the year 1870, she sent a petition to the House of Representatives Judiciary Committee arguing that the new amendments had already given women the right to vote and asking Congress for declaratory legislation that made this clear. Woodhull was given an audience at a hearing of the Judiciary Committee in January 1871 to make her case, the first time this issue would be publicly aired before Congress. Woodhull's appearance posed a problem for feminist leaders, particularly the leaders of the National Women's Suffrage Association, which included Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Although they agreed with Woodhull's legal and constitutional arguments, Victoria Woodhull herself was a magnet for bad publicity. She had the audacity at this time to believe and to say publicly that women had the right to make their own sexual choices and should have the legal right to divorce. This was a position that Victorian-era moralists denounced as free love. Ultimately, Anthony and Stanton decided in favor of solidarity with Woodhull, at least on the voting rights argument, and they attended the congressional hearing. Anthony was supportive of her, but others in the movement, particularly Catherine Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe, treated Woodhull as sort of a loose cannon and urged others not to associate with her. The Ju Judiciary Committee, of course, rejected Woodhull's petition and it went no farther. Woodhull, however, had bigger plans. Not only was she now publicly associated with the new departure stance, but she decided that she was going to run for president in 1872. She announced it by letter in the New York Herald, a competitor to Horace Greeley's paper, as early as April 1870. But a series of women's suffrage conventions in 1871 really got the ball rolling on her official candidacy. In 1871, pursuant to the new departure strategy, hundreds of women across the country attempted to register to vote. Frederick Douglass, who as you recall would eventually be chosen as Woodhull's running mate by the newly formed Equal Rights Party, supported these efforts. One of the women who registered in St. Louis was Virginia Minor, who becomes important later on. I'll get to that in a minute. A group of women who tried to register in Washington, D.C. were turned away, and they sued. A court ruled against them, holding that the 14th and 15th Amendments did not imply voting rights for women. This was the state of things when the 1872 election approached. On November 1st, four days before the election, Susan B. Anthony, accompanied by her sisters, Guelma, Hannah, and Mary, went out to a barber shop in their hometown of Rochester, New York, and demanded to be registered. At this time, voting, place, voting and polling places tend to be, tended to be located in private businesses. Anthony and her cohort cleverly put the election inspectors in a bind, where they could face legal action either for registering them or for turning them away. After consulting a lawyer, the regulators decided it was less dangerous to allow them to register and vote. Four days later, Anthony, together with 14 other women, cast ballots. Anthony did not vote for Victoria Woodhull. She voted for Grant and the Republican ticket. On November 28th, the day before Greeley died, a U.S. Marshal appeared at Susan B. Anthony's house in Rochester to arrest her for violating the voting laws. The other 14 women who voted were also arrested. Anthony had as her lawyer Henry Selden, a well-respected former judge, 
and also previously Lieutenant Governor of New York. Incidentally, Selden was a delegate to the Cincinnati Convention to, of the Liberal Republican Party that nominated Horace Greeley for president. Anthony turned her legal troubles into a media event. She went on a speaking tour to publicize the charges and the various issues involved. Once the trial did begin in Ontario County, New York in June 1873, it was predictably a media circus. Ward Hunt, a U.S. Supreme Court justice, presided. In these days, Supreme Court justices would sometimes preside as trial judges in particular federal circuits. There is considerable evidence that the trial was rigged from the beginning. Justice Hunt had apparently written out his opinion in the case before the trial even began, and he short-circuited the jury by issuing what's called a directed verdict, essentially an order by the judge in a case that the jury must bring in a certain verdict, which sounds outrageous, and is, but it was technically legal at this time, although it was prohibited under these circumstances later in the 19th century. Needless to say, Anthony was found guilty and fined $100, which she refused to pay. She gave an impassioned speech to the courtroom, which became one of the more famous orations in the history of the women's suffrage movement. Anthony argued that she had not been given a trial by jury of her peers, because of course women were prohibited from serving on juries in 1873. She argued with Justice Hunt and in fact got the better of him. He declined to have Anthony taken into custody until she paid the fine, in part because that would have enabled her another judicial platform to state her views if she had challenged in court her incarceration. The fine, in fact, was never paid. Although 14 other women were charged in the voting incident, Anthony was the only one who was prosecuted. Several of the election inspectors who had allowed Anthony and the others to vote were convicted of various charges, but Grant pardoned them in 1874. The case was a major shot in the arm to the women's suffrage movement, despite or possibly because of the guilty verdict. Women around the United States redoubled their efforts to secure the vote, and in the wake of Anthony's conviction, hundreds more attempted to vote in coming elections. In 1875, the United States Supreme Court decided the truly awful case of Minor versus Happerset. It arose from the registration of Virginia Minor in St. Louis, who I mentioned a moment ago. This case held that U.S. citizenship did not implicitly confer the right to vote, which meant that states could continue to prohibit women from voting. Again, totally contrary to the language and the spirit of the 14th and 15th Amendment. Together with several other cases in the 1870s, including another one that I'll talk about in the next chapter, the U.S. Supreme Court significantly narrowed what rights Americans had in the 1870s and set the stage for the end of Reconstruction, which otherwise should have expanded rather than curtailed the civil rights not just of people of color, but also women, and in fact, all Americans. Minor versus Happerset remained on the books until it was effectively overturned by the 19th Amendment passed in 1920, which finally granted women the right to vote. The constitutional amendment strategy was the only path left after the Supreme Court gutted the new departure idea in that case. Had the new departure strategy succeeded, Susan B. Anthony's case might have led to the enfranchisement of American women nearly 50 years before it eventually happened. This missed opportunity is unfortunately also a legacy of the election of 1872. On March 4, 1873, President and Mrs. Grant rode to the U.S. Capitol in a black carriage accompanied by the usual dignitaries. The temperature in Washington that day was bitterly cold, only 16 degrees Fahrenheit, with a wind chill estimated at about 16 below zero. Grant took the oath of office in this freezing weather. Even worse, the official inaugural ball was held shortly afterward in a temporary building that had been set up on Judiciary Square in Washington. It wasn't heated. Guests' drinks literally froze in their glasses. Among the ostentatious decor, the temporary ballroom had a bunch of canaries in ornate cages hanging around, and it was so cold that the canaries literally dropped dead. Grant and his wife hung around for about half an hour and then left, preferring to celebrate his inauguration in a building that actually had heat. You might think that, bad weather aside, Grant's decisive victory and the peaceful inauguration of 1873 
was a more or less happy ending for President Grant. You'd be wrong. For one thing, the Michigas in Louisiana was far from resolved. Remember those two dueling legislatures, the two guys each claiming to be legitimate governor, William McEnery and William Pitt Kellogg? Well, in early 1873, they were still duking it out in court and also in the streets and parishes of Louisiana. Militias and paramilitary forces got involved. In simpler terms, the Civil War basically reignited within the state of Louisiana. The worst of the violence occurred at a place called Colfax, the seat of Grant Parish. They call counties parishes in Louisiana. The ground level specifics of this conflict are heinously complicated, and I don't need to go into them here. But suffice it to say, on April 13, 1873, white supremacist paramilitary groups clashed with mostly African-American militiamen trying to defend the Grant Parish Courthouse. At least 60 and possibly as many as 153 people were killed, most of them black militiamen who were murdered after they had been taken prisoner by the racist paramilitary. Essentially, it was a mass lynching. The Colfax Massacre was the worst single outbreak of racial violence in the entire Reconstruction era. Federal troops eventually had to swoop down to restore order in Colfax. But in another ugly foreshadowing of what was eventually to come, after two trials of the white perpetrators, they ultimately went free. Even worse, the incident led to a legal challenge against one of the federal laws, the Enforcement Act of 1870, that had enabled federal authorities to crack down on racist terrorism. In the case of U.S. v. Cruikshank, decided in March 1876, the U.S. Supreme Court gutted the Enforcement Act, ruling that victims of racist violence such as the Colfax Massacre could only look to state, not federal, authorities for protection. Of course, state governments, if and when they were taken over by racist whites, would deliberately allow violence against African Americans. U.S. v. Cruikshank was decided just in time for the 1876 presidential election. After more court challenges, the pro-Grant Republican Governor William Pitt Kellogg was eventually anointed the legitimate, more or less legitimate, governor of Louisiana. But he was terribly corrupt. Even Grant himself thought so. No one could figure out who legitimately won the state or national elections in Louisiana in 1872. Furthermore, subsequent events validated some of the criticisms of Grant made by the liberal Republicans in 1872. More scandals erupted in the Grant administration over the next months and years. I already talked about Credit Mobilier. Another round of crooked business came to light involving a tax commissioner, John Sanborn, who had used federal monies to feather his own nest. Swindlers were exposed in the Department of the Interior and the Department of Justice. A huge scandal popped in 1874 involving an organized evasion of taxes on whiskey in St. Louis, the so-called Whiskey Ring. This was such a serious matter that President Grant himself was deposed in February 1876 in this case. By the end of his second term, Grant was sinking in a sea of grift, graft, scandal, and bad press. He was inclined to break Washington's informal rule that a president should not serve more than two terms, but due to all the scandals, he wisely decided to stand down and not seek a third term in 1876. Oh, and in addition to all this scandal, there was a huge economic collapse. In September 1873, a financial panic on Wall Street led to a widespread depression in the United States and Europe. Essentially, this was the popping of an economic bubble involving the railroads, which had been way overbuilt, their finances deeply intertwined with public money. The aftermath rippled outward for years, le leading eventually to a series of crippling railroad strikes in 1877. Something else also happened in Grant's second term that was to have profound consequences down the road. Remember how Grant used the Ku Klux Klan Act and other federal acts to crack down on white supremacist terrorism in the South? The fact that so many of those terrorists were in jail is part of why the 1872 elections in the former Confederate States weren't as spoiled by intimidation and violence as they otherwise might have been. But the terrorists who were sent to jail in that 1871-72 time period started to get out of prison in large numbers a few years later. And as we just saw, the courts, including the Supreme Court, had weakened some of the federal government's law enforcement powers 
to prevent racial terrorism. The Klan and other terrorist organizations went right back to do, doing what they'd been doing before, again right in time for the next presidential election. With Grant not running in 1876 and no popular heir apparent that would hold the Republican majority together, Democrats saw their best opening in years to recapture the White House. The liberal Republicans were by this time extinct. The scandals had proven them right, at least on the corruption issue, but the best chance for people who didn't like what Grant had done to change course was to go with the traditional Democratic Party, not a splinter faction of Republicans. The Democrats would definitely not sit this next election out. So the 1876 election came down to a contest between Samuel J. Tilden of New York, Democrat, and Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio, Republican. What happened in 1872 in Louisiana happened in several more southern states in 1876 between voter intimidation and violence by racist terrorists and election chicanery on the local level, several states, including Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina, had two dueling factions, each claiming to be the legitimate state government, exactly what had happened in Louisiana in 1872. And each of these factions sent their own slate of electoral votes to Congress. So what you had were four electoral votes from Florida for Hayes and another set of four electoral votes for Florida for Tilden. Florida had only four electoral votes, etc. The problem, just as we saw on a small scale in 1873, was which slate was the real electoral vote of those states, representing the will of the voters of those states. It was impossible to tell. There was in 1877 also a more traditional objection, that being to the qualification of a single elector in Oregon. A total of 20 electoral votes were at stake this time, an amount that, unlike in 1872, was definitely enough to determine the outcome. As you may know, the 1876 election was resolved by an extra-constitutional electoral commission made up of senators, congressmen, and Supreme Court justices. No provision for such a body appears in the Constitution, but then again, it doesn't prohibit it either. The commission would essentially do, formally and separately, what Congress had done in joint session in February 1873, debate and decide what to do about disputed electoral votes and which ones to count. The commission ultimately awarded all 20 disputed electoral votes to Hayes. But as a sop to the southern states and Democrats, Hayes agreed to withdraw federal troops from those former Confederate states. This proved disastrous for the African-American population of the entire United States. Because those troops were the last thing defending anything even resembling voting rights for African-Americans by being able to protect polling places and act against the racist terrorists, what this withdrawal of troops meant was that every state government in the former Confederacy could now enact its own state-level laws and procedures to keep blacks from voting. The resulting all-white racist state governments passed laws that made African Americans second-class citizens, segregating everything that wasn't outright barred to people of color, and the government and judicial systems of these states refused to lift a finger to stop violence and lynchings. This was the way things stood until the civil rights movement of the 20th century, which was percolating throughout the decades following Reconstruction, but which finally got going in earnest in the 1940s, just after World War II. So that's the longer story. You might want to know what happened to the various players in the story of the election of 1872. Greeley's running mate, Benjamin Gratz Brown, became a Democrat after the election and went back to his law practice. He died in 1885. President Ulysses Grant also died in 1885 of throat cancer, possibly caused by smoking cigars for his entire adult life. His reputation has recently been rehabilitated by historian Ron Chernow, whose previous book on Hamilton became the basis of the hit musical. Carl Schurz, who mostly sparked the whole liberal Republican phenomenon, served as Secretary of the Interior under President Rutherford Hayes. After that, he went to live in New York City and died in 1906. Shortly before the election of 1872, in which she was a candidate for president, Victoria Woodhull published an issue of her self-run newspaper attacking fellow suffragist reformer Henry Ward Beecher and exposing his extramarital affairs. 
She was arrested on charges of obscenity, but acquitted. She ran for president again in 1884 and 1892, but by that time she was living out of the country in England, where after an eventful life, she died in 1927. Susan B. Anthony continued to work tirelessly for women's suffrage, feminism, and gender equality right up to the end of her life. She died in 1906 in the same house where she had been arrested for voting in the 1872 election. In 2020, Anthony was posthumously pardoned by President Donald Trump. The Susan B. Anthony Museum publicly refused the pardon. Greeley's famous newspaper, the New York Tribune, continued on after his death with continued success. In 1924, it merged with another New York paper to form the New York Herald Tribune, which continued publishing until 1947. Horace Greeley is, at the time of the making of this video, still dead and still cooling his heels in Greenwood Cemetery. I believe the election of 1872 remains the strangest and most unusual presidential contest in American history. It wasn't close, its outcome was not disputed, and it didn't usher in a bold new era. But it was very, very strange. Never before or since has one of the major party candidates died before the process was finished. Never since has one of the major parties decided to sit out a presidential election entirely and nominate someone from their rival party as their own nominee. Indeed, something like that happening today would be absolutely unthinkable. But 1872 was a strange and confusing time. The aftermath of the Civil War was still unsettled and chaotic. Reconstruction held great promise for doing some sort of justice to make up for the evil of slavery that was so fundamental to American society. But in the end, it was botched, and African Americans continued to suffer repeated violations of all their basic rights, including the ones guaranteed to them in the 14th and 15th Amendments. The failure of Reconstruction is a dark chapter in American history. Thanks so much for watching. I've got several other long form deep dive videos on my channel. The most popular one at the time of this, write, of this writing is my deconstruction of the very complicated Iran-Contra scandal of the 1980s. I've also examined the troubled life of Franklin Pierce, the Titanic disaster, and the Kennedy assassination. I have a book out on Kindle, The 50 Most Important Things in History a short primer on the major events in world history from 3.7 million years ago to the 21st century, and my blog and website are linked in the description. So if you liked this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, do all the stuff you normally do for a video you like. And thanks again for joining me on another journey into the past.